Sister Shannon, would you say a prayer for us, please? Our Father, which art in heaven, we are very grateful for the ability of technology that allows us to gather throughout this summertime, that we are being able to have our um, hearts and our minds and our spirits expanded, Father, with knowledge and understanding. We are grateful for the Seminarian Institute program and for all those many, many hands that um, provide us instructions. We are grateful for this opportunity today. And um, please bless um, Brother Lowry as he um, presents his thoughts and feelings to us that the spirit will be with each of us, that we will be able to take it into our hearts and, and use and learn and grow so that as we um, begin this new school year that we father will be able to gather with these wonderful youth and that we will be the type of teacher that they need at this time in their lives once again and we are grateful for our blessings we are grateful for our savior and all that he has done for us and we are grateful for this time to gather and we pray and ask for thy blessings in the name of thy son jesus christ amen amen, amen. thank you sister shannon appreciate that if you can see on the screen, if it's showing right, we'll just, uh, as we get started, to go ahead and put in a chat box your name, the location you're teaching at, so you're kind of the stake or city where you're at. Um, the type of class you're teaching, which is going to be whether it be seminary or, or institute, maybe you're doing an online seminary, maybe you're doing a live Zoom class seminary, whichever type, and then the number of years you've been teaching with seminary institute, and you typically want your um, called in the seminary or institute, you, you typically end up transitioning within different classes. It's not uncommon to teach early morning and then go to online and maybe then go to institute or go to a supervisor or go back to early morning. It's um, and if you if you are one of those people, we're we're grateful for your um, your love for the scriptures and teaching because it sure does make a difference in so many lives. Um, I'm Brother Lowry. I'm over in the Gainesville, Florida area. Um, and so look forward to the opportunity we have to visit this morning. The, um, these classes, as you've seen, if this is some of you, I've recognized you from other classes recently. Um, these are, are meant to be individualized classes. We understand that the time of day or travel in summer, these aren't meant to be something that you were, you know, seeing every lesson, but they're meant to be, uh, tools that you can then go to as an individual in servicing opportunities rather than maybe driving four hours to a certain spot then be in service for one day we're hoping this will give you a lot more um, in servicing opportunities that will be on demand uh, the video if it records right and works well will be uploaded onto our area youtube page um, and, and you can go back and watch those on demand as well and so um, for today our um, our objective with this lesson is 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 to focus on the inviting learners to remember the truth and importance of principles being taught. Um, th this is not in any way the start of how lessons obviously work. This is an idea of breaking up a lesson and thinking, all right, if I'm looking at certain components of teaching, uh, this is one aspect of it. And so as, as we're looking at that, I'd like you to remember that um, before we teach any lesson or have any class, we want to make sure we look at and remind ourselves what the objective of the class is. So very often we might say that um, that I get overwhelmed, like maybe let's say this week with Ezra and Nehemiah. I got to download this data of the scriptures. We know that that's not our job. And so if uh, Sister Larson, since you're the first person I can see up here, would you mind reading and remind, remind us of our objective, please? Okay. Our purpose is to help youth and young adults understand and rely on the teachings and atonement of Jesus Christ, qualify for the blessings of the temple, and prepare themselves, their families, and others for eternal life with our Father in heaven. Thank you so much, Sister Larson. I, I would invite you to put that somewhere, print it and put it somewhere in, in your prep area to remind you that when we get into lessons, that that's the objective of every single lesson, every single day, uh, to create opportunities to connect the student to Christ, his atonement, 
the powerful covenants that are provided by the uh, temple and the eternal perspective that we're trying to reach uh, with the, the Savior, and that's to return back to our Father in heaven in a, in a package with all of Israel gathered together. So um, sometimes we get in survival mode, right? And we get to teaching and we start looking at what's next. And it's Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah. And all right, let me go look at all that I got to cover in this block. And we start to kind of build. Now, if, if uh, I'm viewing this lesson today as a part two lesson, if you watch July 6th lesson with Brother Webb on um, teachings, doctrines, and principles, helping to identify what doctrine principle is in the scriptures, this is part two really of that lesson. Because when we come together and we start to look at our lesson plan, um, the teaching and learning pattern works for every lesson, right? That's that's the building block. Um, President Uchtdorf, Elder Uchtdorf just referenced even in, in his recent devotional for us. So this is the basic core of any lesson. And you can even maybe even go more simple if you want to say search, analyze, and apply. But you want to, as we help students understand the context and content, and then identify doctrine and principles, those two, and understanding doctrine and principles, those three were focused with Brother Webb on the July 6 training. So if you feel like you need some more focus on how to better use context and content, doctrines and principles, go back on the YouTube page to the July 6 training, and you'll be able to see that and can um, build on that. Our focus today is the last two. Feel the truth and importance of the doctrine and principles and apply these doctrine and principles. That's where I feel like we're in a part two of the uh, July 6 training. So as we are looking at our lesson, and let's say we're going to be looking at Ezra and Nehemiah this week in our studies, if I'm teaching seminary and I'm a history nut, I might um, get geeked out with all the history and seeing the Babylonian conqueror of Persia and bringing in the temple back to Israel and all that's going on with the people that have intermingled with faith, this different gods and religions in the area. And I might go into this great history lesson and the students walk out not being inspired. So our job is not to teach history lessons. It's not to teach heavy lessons on context and content, but rather to remember the ultimate objective. How do I connect them to Christ? How do I connect them to the enabling power of the atonement? How do I help them see the promised blessings of the temple and to connect them and all of Israel together to our Heavenly Father? And so as I do that in the part of this part of our lesson where we want to help them remember and to draw on experiences spiritually and emotionally, then we want to kind of move into that direction. I, I tend to think we can mess up, and that's why the July 6th training I think was so effective is we want to go so quickly to the feel and apply because they're easy questions. And, but if I don't base that foundation good enough on the context and content and identify doctrines and principles, the part of this lesson where you're going to connect them to truths won't click. You'll get them talking and they'll all be sharing, but it won't click to the atonement, to the Savior's enabling power to rescue to the promised blessings of the temple and gathering Israel to return back to our Father in heaven. It'll just be talk. So if, if we don't connect the feeling to a doctrine and principle, we really have, have missed the mark. So I just want to stress real importantly right here, as we focus on our practicing today of remembering doctrines and principles, the truths that go with them in our life, we want to be able to link them together, kind of like that car or that truck and trailer. And so um, as we practice this, be cautious that we run so quickly to this skill set that we, we don't have the foundation set. We want to be really careful of that. Um, are there any questions that we have regarding this before we get started that might be on your mind or a concern with any of this said so far? All right, so let's take the Savior then and see how he did it as a model first. And so you all know this. Let's go to Matthew 16 if you've got your scriptures. I'm purposely grabbing something that we have a little history of context and content in our mind. I think we've all have taught this, read it, studied it, 
probably a thousand times in our life. And so in our discussion, we know that the Savior is has the 12 with him. He's gathered them around together. And he's going to say, okay, a lot of things have been happening. I want to see where we're at with things. He asks these effective questions. Notice as we read it that we're looking for specifically how he lends to causing them to remember a feeling and then builds off the feeling experience. Um, can I ask Sister Teal, would you mind, if you're in an environment, would you mind reading this for us? Thank you. And just again, look for specifically where the Savior is using this idea of remembering or attaching emotion applies to this experience. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All right, thank you so much, Sister Teal. Now, before you share with me what stood out to you in this, in this dialogue, as he's asking his class, right, the class that's there before him, and this one-on-one -on -one experience occurs with the students, um, remember that as we're looking at this teaching skill, that we're inviting learners to remember the truth and the importance of principles being taught. So he's going to connect a feeling to a future behavior. So sometimes we connect that we identify the feeling real well. Hey, remember an experience you had where you felt this. But if we don't connect it to a step now ahead, how I use this, then we're just simply remembering emotions, right? So what do you notice? What stood out to you in your, your experience watching this? The but thing that stood out to me was, who do you say I am? Doesn't matter what everybody else says. Who do you say I am? Yeah, he went very personal very quickly, right? So he's asking all of them as a group, all right, I know people are talking about me. I know they're saying things. And so what are they saying? That's his readiness question. And then he comes in next with that personal feeling question, whom say ye that I am? Thank you, Sister Marshall. Sister Shannon, was your hand up? No, nope. somebody else? Maybe I missed it. I caught somebody else was about to say something. I was just going to say he was asking their feelings, what they thought. And, All uh, right. So he's causing what, them to now reflect back on their, how would they define it? Right. So everyone, people are calling me this. Who do you think I am? Now he's asking a question that causes them to, to think inward. Uh, Sister Word. Um, what I got from that uh, is what's so important right now with our youth is you're going to hear uh, other people say say things that they believe are true, but not just what what do you think, but go to Heavenly Father, go go to Father in Heaven and ask, so that you are using that inspiration, not just off the top of your head, um, because it takes time to to really reflect on what is the truth when so many distractions are about you. And it's a lesson in going to prayer. Oh, I, I, there were several about. things in that that I just thought were such wonderful comments. Sister Ward, one of the things that I visualized in my mind when you were sharing that was, what was the gap that the Savior allowed for them to be quiet and think when he asked that, whom say ye that I am? So now he went inward, like you're saying, Sister Ward. And so now he gave them time to think. Giving our students questions that cause them to look inside and then allow there to be quiet time to let them process that emotion, that question, and where they interpret it in a one-on-one -on -one experience, like you're saying, the likening aspect of it. Love that. Thank you so much. There's also an implication here that uh, when, after Peter testifies that he is the Christ, 
when uh, there is something in how he said that that helped Jesus know that it was not because someone told him that. He says, it's not flesh and blood that revealed it to you, but my father, which is in heaven. So uh, the spirit was present. Okay, so Sister Jensen, you're saying then that as the Savior taught, he acknowledged the presence of the Spirit, teaching them that truth. So yeah. what does that look like in your classroom, Sister Jensen? I actually have not started teaching yet, um, but I, I know what it looks like in my family. Okay, what does that look like? Um, often I, I am uh, cautious about, uh, as a group, saying that uh do you feel the spirit i feel the spirit right now um but i instead like to try to ask questions about how they're feeling so that they can identify it themselves because i especially if they say something like they're answering a question in our come follow me and i say well how do you know that um and what 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 makes you so sure about that to try to guide them into that kind of recognition that you have to figure out. Sister Jensen, the caution you gave was really critical as a teaching skill. And that was be careful to not make such general statements that causes a student to think they're failing. I had a student just yesterday say to me, everyone else keeps saying they have these experiences, the spirit's giving them impressions. I'm not feeling that. And so does that mean the Holy Ghost isn't working with them? No, it means that they've got to learn how to communicate with the Holy Ghost and how that Holy Ghost is talking to them. But if we're too general, everyone right now has had an impression God spoke to you. And our kid's like, I didn't hear anything. And so the caution is really great when we talk about using the skill of inviting them to remember, or in this case, having them to connect a feeling to a truth. We want to be careful that we don't say it in a way that causes them to think, no, I haven't done that yet. And so when we come back and the Savior in this sense is saying that truth, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus answered and said, blessed art thou, Son of Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, Christ is saying in that moment, Simon, that's, that's your, your spot on. What you just said was taught to you by the Holy Ghost. That is an eternal truth. And I want you to know that whether you recognize it or not, God helped you to learn that truth the spirit has taught you that truth because many times they don't realize that's what was teaching them that and so we want to connect them with the mm -hmm. feeling and the truth that you're having is connected to the holy ghost teaching you these things mm -hmm. in your life can i say something please i also think that sometimes um if you say oh i feel the spirit can you feel the spirit that it's if they say they feel the spirit, it doesn't, they're just saying what you said, and it must be true. You're the teacher. So they not always do they feel the spirit, but they think they should because you do. Great caution. So what we want to help them to do in these memories is let the Holy Ghost remind them of experiences they've had and then help them to connect that with their testimony. And, and so we, we're trying to help them, like the Savior just did with Peter, to connect a, a thought, a truth, a doctrine or principle that they've learned with their own experience. So he's asked them for this doctrine and principle, and then he lets Peter know, yes, that is a truth, and you learn that through revelation. And now what's he going to do next? So he's not done teaching, right? He's drawn back to an experience. He, and he said, okay, where, where have you had this experience? And I love that, that he's gone straight to, to Peter now, and there's a one-on-one -on -one dialogue in the classroom. And, and remember that you can do this, and really, I really recommend that we do it more often. When a student talks to you and shares, have that one-on-one -on -one dialogue with them in that moment and let the class watch that one-on-one -on -one teaching experience and let the spirit teach them through that as that one-on-one -on -one moment's happening. So in this case, the savior then says to, to, to Simon, what? How's he gonna connect? Where's the next connection to application? Yeah, you know, I'm, you know, I'm Christ, yay. 
Mm -hmm. I'm done. You figured me out. I like in verse 18, where he then is saying, um, going back to Peter, where he has felt something, he already knows something. And then he's saying, I will build my church. So as you were talking about looking forward and what, um, you know, as I start to take the next steps. And so I, um, that phrase, I mean, I've read that, like you said, we've read this, these scriptures over and over again, but as you explained at the beginning to take the truth, attach it to an emotion, but then how are, how am I moving forward with it? That phrase really jumped out at me. I will build, and you can have a really wonderful, um, you know, opening up with the kids, like after you've already talked about what they have felt, you know, maybe those, those things that they may already know or believe or um, trust in, then, okay, when I walk out that door, that seminary door today, how am I going to build on that? And then maybe have, have them, you know, share what they can be doing to help build from what they, from what their foundation is. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Sister Shannon. And, and, and so I, when you were saying that, so we're, we're seeing that thou art Peter and upon this rock revelation I will build my church. I'll build my gospel in you, right? And upon revelation, once you get it in you and it becomes rocked, you know, solid in you, hell can't mess with you. Satan and the world can't break you. Once you have this, you know, in you, that, that personal revelation that teaches you truth is more critical than anything else going forward. And if you don't know for yourself, then you're open up to the adversary. So the scripture that comes to mind right there would be Helaman 5.12, right? The, the pleading, remember, remember what? It's called the foundation of Christ. All right. So remember that you got to anchor on Christ because if you anchor on Christ, then what? You fall apart. <laughs> yeah. Verse 18, nothing will prevail. Storms, no matter what they won't work because you're anchored in the rock of that personal revelation that Jesus is the Christ and the critical nature that goes with it. I love in just a few verses, the Savior's done exactly what we're being asked to do on a regular basis. To regularly ask questions, inviting students to identify a truth that they are willing to say, I believe this, Help them to acknowledge that is the Holy Ghost helping you to know that truth. And now what's going to happen if you act on that truth in your life? And then give them the promised blessing of that. If you do act on this truth that you feel, here's what will happen as a byproduct. But help them discover, help them follow up with those answers in a discussion. So let's look at, I think President Eyring is one of the best at this. All right, and so let me get a reader. Somebody that's not read yet or shared anything out loud, please. Just somebody wouldn't mind, but you're in a good environment. And it's two slides, but I want you just to kind of notice this is a 1998. That's that's like archaic, right? You say this to the kids and they, they think it's like World War II. I mean, it's like forever ago. So 1998, this is President Eyring. Uh, the Lord will multiply the harvest. And he, and he talks about how we ask questions that invite us to remember truth. Got a volunteer? Wouldn't mind reading? I'll do it. Thank I'll you, Sister McLaws. I suggest one more routine, routine tool that we might use more effectively. To ask and to answer questions is at the heart of all learning and all teaching. The master asked, answered, and sometimes chose not to answer questions in his ministry. The curriculum suggests many questions to ask and to ponder. Some of those questions require only an answer of fact taken from memory. Who was the father of Helaman? Or unto whom is this land consecrated? But some questions invite inspiration. Great teachers ask those. That may take just a small change of words, an inflection in the voice. Here is a question that might not invite inspiration. How is a true prophet recognized? 
That question invites an answer, which is a list drawn from memory of the scriptures and the words of living prophets. Many students could participate in answering. Most could give at least a passable suggestion and the minds would be stimulated. But we could also ask the question this way, with just a small difference. When have you felt that you were in the presence of a prophet? That will invite individuals to search their memories for feelings. After asking, we might wisely wait for a moment before calling on someone to respond. Even those who do not speak will be thinking of spiritual experiences. That will invite the Holy Ghost. Then, even if no one should speak, they will be ready for you to bear Okay, sorry. They will be ready for you to bear a quiet testimony of your witness that we are blessed to live when God has called prophets to guide and teach us. Thank you, Sister McLaws. Now, now I could, with seasoned teachers on here, whether it be uh, different assignments you've had in the past, we could spend 15, 20 minutes on what he said and how to apply it into our classroom. Now, we had Sister McLaws read it because I wanted it to be fresh in your mind of what he's talking about with the difference of a question saying such as who was the father of Helaman rather to edit that type of question to when have you felt that you were in the presence of a prophet and the contrast of that. So now we understand what he's talking about. I want you to listen to president Iring as he says it now and don't, don't do anything more than just listen. And I want you to just listen to something that stands out to you as a feeling as you're listening to his voice. And the spirit. Now I suggest one more routine to use more effectively. To ask and to answer questions is at the heart of all learning and all teaching. The master asked, answered, and sometimes chose not to answer questions in his ministry. The curriculum suggests many questions to ask and to ponder. Some of those questions require only an answer of fact taken from memory. Who is the father of Helaman? Or unto whom is this land consecrated? But some questions invite inspiration. Great teachers ask those. That may take just a small change of words and inflection in the voice. Here is a question that might not invite inspiration. How is a true prophet recognized? That question invites an answer, which is a list drawn from memory of the scriptures and the words of living prophets. Many students could participate in answering. Most could give at least a passable suggestion and their minds will be stimulated. But we could also ask the question this way with just a small difference. When have you felt that you were in the presence of a prophet? That will invite students to search their memories for feelings. After asking, we might wisely wait for a moment before calling on someone to respond. Even those who do not speak will be thinking of spiritual experiences. That will invite the Holy Ghost, then even if no one should speak, they will be ready for you to bear quiet testimony of your witness that we are blessed to live when God has called prophets to guide and teach us. All right, so what stood out to y'all? Having now read it, and then listen to him. I hope you could hear okay. It seems quite, the volume seems a little lower on my end. What stood out to you? I, th I think the individuality of the questions. Okay. Is that the inspiration when you're, you may be speaking to a classroom, but your questions adjust as you are looking at these students and feeling the spirit. So I think for, for me, it was just kind of the very individualistic manner in which you asked the questions. It really depended on who you were teaching. Okay, so allowing the questions to adjust in the room with the spirit as the spirit gives you some ways to tweak maybe some initial questions you had. Thank you, right. Sister Green. For me, it was a little bit different. It wasn't so much the words he was saying, but as he was saying it, the thoughts and feelings that came into my heart of the different experiences that I have had um, knowing that who the prophet is or being in the presence of one of the apostles and feeling that spirit. So it wasn't the words he said, it was the, the spirit and the remembrance that he invited through it. 
isn't that isn't that amazing that when we sat here and read it and listened to it how i don't know for y'all but when they're listening to it i went to an experience i have in that right our mind then as sister teal you're talking about we we then draw our brain just go straight to memories by him tweaking that question that way and emotions immediately come in love that thank you sister teal sister sister green um when we pause when we ask a question and then pause we are then inviting them into the conversation that pause is so critical because up to that point you're just having a conversation with yourself and when you pause you now have extended the invitation for them to join the conversation which is what you really that's what we really, really want. Who's the conversation with? It's not me. Exactly. It's the Holy it's, Ghost, isn't it? Right. But if you don't, if you don't pause, the only person that's had a conversation with you is you. It, it is a monologue, if you will, right? Yeah. And so that's where we got to be really careful. One, let me just put in, if we're not balancing or, or setting up a pacing guide for our lesson that day, then we can find ourselves in context and content far too long. The context and content, while extremely critical, as we said we started, if you don't do it, you can't get to hear. But if you spend too much time on that, you get to hear where the Holy Ghost now can have power, and we've lost it because we lost time. So we've really got to structure our lessons and kind of have little reminders of, okay, five minutes here, five minutes here, 10 minutes here, whatever, but make sure I balance my time. And maybe it was five minutes here. Now I'm going to go into to remember, and now I'm going to go to my next content context. Now remember and break up my lessons. It almost like gears and a 10 speed. And so that great, great comment, Sister Green, invite others to have experiences with the conversation of the Lord, because we pause and allow the spirit to work to do his job, to bring things back to our memory. That's one of his primary key teaching tools. So are we giving him that time to do his job? Great. I Thank would you. also I would also add to that, that probably in teaching, that is the most skipped over or piece. Um, it, it's probably the most skipped over. I, I, I mean, I can think of probably every week of my life going to church and having a question asked and before I even had time to digest quite the question to even think of an answer <laughs> that you know the answer was being given to me already so what you're the skill you're talking about is recognizing that every learner has a different process of of how they learn and to give each learner adequate time to process questions or to uh, recall data experiences whatever and so be comfortable in silence as a teacher absolutely uh, allow uh, allow that skill set to uh, say i'm going to give you um two minutes and this is where journals become a really effective tool in your classroom um i i, I did one last night where i said okay would you on your phones make a list of all the temples you've been to or, or that you physically have seen it's just a data question but it's a it's a primer and then a question that would come behind it would be what experiences what emotions or experiences did you have that you felt when you were there and now they're going to go back and think of not just the structure but an emotional connection to it and there are other ways to approach that and other ways to to use that but sister Moore. um so the place that i get blank stares and if you could help maybe with wording of the question is that when I ask them experiential questions, the first knee jerk reaction I get is we don't have enough life experience to answer that question, especially the freshmen, the seniors are willing to talk to me. Um, but the freshmen um, are shy and they don't, they will tell you that they can't answer that because it's an, they don't have enough life experience to answer that question. So um, in a class setting where we're all sitting around and we're working in a lesson, I probably would then invite my students to share their experiences with that to help in a dialogue of it. Uh, with regard to this training, I wanna go practice that 
and let's see what that looks like, um, where I can get my students to share their experiences with it is um, more powerful than me sharing my experience. So I'm going to violate that law. Uh, just last night in my lesson, somebody had mentioned earlier, maybe it was Sister Larson or so, that said, allow your lesson to adapt, uh, recognizing that maybe my students hadn't ever made significant sacrifices to build a temple or to go to a temple. Uh, because of the access to many of them today, I asked, what are some sacrifices you know that your parents or grandparents or people on your mission have experienced to go to the temple? What sacrifices have you seen people make to go to the temple? And so it was not a personal one, but it was a setup. I was using a question to have them remember somebody else's experience to then lead them into what are we doing to prepare for and to have experiences in the temple? So you can, in that sense, you can ask them questions of who are others that you know, experiences they've had, and then link it to them as well. So honor the fact that, yeah, they don't have massive life experiences, but what they have had does work. But the primer questions sometimes help them to link that. Would that help with what, what you're asking, Sister Moore? Yeah, that was on point. So let's go practice it. So this is the scripture theme for the youth this year. Uh, if they went to FSY, if they've had that yet, uh, this was their heavy focus every day of the FSY. Um, if not, they're still having it in all the classes, your classes, devotional, so forth and so on. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. So in our class experience, we have already discussed what the doctrines and principles are of this verse. So obviously we're building off that because you've got to do content, context, which is not content history of a proverb but in this idea we've we've identified what doctrine a fixed truth that never changes is the principle the application and how it looks and now we're going to go to this next part of connecting past experiences identifying gospel truths that connect to it with that and then how we link it to tomorrow that one two and three you're seeing is what christ did in matthew 16 so we're referencing that experience that we just saw christ do so would you take a second and would you think of some questions that would allow you to do one, two, and three with Proverbs 3, 5? So you've already discussed what does it mean to trust the Lord. You've already had that doctrinal discussion. What does this mean and what does it look like? Now you're going to go into Sister Mora. Maybe they not, have they had vast experiences with trusting the Lord? So maybe you might prime it with something else of some you know somebody else in their life when have you seen somebody in your life trust the lord so that's nothing wrong with that right because your memories you're drawing back past experiences because you're going to link them to truth and link them to future behavior in this train of of data so take it just a second right sister green we don't want to go we don't want to move yet we want to give time to pause would you take a second and write down one two or three how you might be able to act on questions, present hiring, inspire questions, create this conversion. Give you just a few minutes. Anybody has a question, you're welcome to speak up while people are working. So you're asking us to think of the questions to trigger one, two, and three. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you're teaching this to your students right now, and you're wanting to then connect to what does it mean to trust the Lord how does that look and how have they already done it? I'm going to submit to you they've already done it. Even a 13, 14 year old that's a freshman in high school. They just don't realize they've done it. So, so I want to help them to remember what that looks like. And Sister Moore's idea of they may not think they've done it. So maybe I might want to use somebody else in their family too. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But how would you create these three cars in a train of remember past experiences? connect it to an eternal truth and create a connection to linked behavior outside of class today. Oh, I'm just gonna ask people if they're willing to put their questions in the chat. Oh, that's a great idea, Sister McLaws. And that way we get everyone's comments. Those watching this on a recording later on, I'm, Oh, 
For the sake of our recording and those watching this at a later date, let me just read some of these out loud so that you can hear them for future views. I'm going to ask you a question, and while you think on your own experience, I will share one of mine. And so, Sister Green, your idea there is I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to share one of mine, and that might then jog your memory of how it's looked in your life. Right. So my question, of course, to them would be Proverbs, Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 5. You know, when in your life have you felt that you trusted in the Lord, even though you didn't understand why or how you were going to get blessed from it? And while you think about that, I'll share a time in my life I did that when I was really close to your age. So another skill set as some of you are typing on here is writing these this assignment up on the board for them to be able to, for those that maybe don't understand the question, because we just said it out loud, have it where they can see it up on the board, question one, you know, when have you had this experience or something like that? Because you're gonna break these up into discussions, right? If you and I are teaching, we're gonna do what Christ did. He's gonna ask one question, then he's gonna come back and discuss that and then go to the next one and then let the next one. So he linked all three together, but there was gaps in between those, those discussions. So. Uh, my first question in this regard would be, when's the experience you've had where you've had to trust in the Lord, something to that degree, and we're going to discuss it as a group. Then we're going to connect truth, discuss it as a group. Then we're going to connect to behavior. Thank you. Um, I mean, I can just I, imagine. I can just imagine when our kids were all home, if <laughs> you know, and and we had that age range that right? we had five of them in, mm -hmm. you know, eleven to eighteen, right? So I can just imagine what their answers would be. And I'm telling you, they would go all the way from, I don't even know if I trust in the Lord. Right. I don't even, I don't even think about trusting in the Lord. I don't even, I don't even know what I understand and what I don't understand. <laughs> I can literally think in my own family of like what my teenagers could have responded or may have been thinking and would have never even said what they were thinking all the way down to like the 11 year old who is still sweet and just coming out of primary and remembered when they prayed to find the kitty cat. <laughs> so I, I think that's a great, um, the realist lenses of our lessons, looking at our students in the classroom thinking, how's John gonna respond to this? How's Sarah gonna respond to this? How's Bill gonna respond to this? Seeing our students as we develop these questions in our lesson plans is really a critical skill set in, in developing that lesson. Um, I do like, Sister Mora, the idea that I may confess or state a truth of you may not think you've ever trusted the Lord, and we honor that. So maybe it's not you, but somebody else that you've seen an example of that. That way, the student that you're thinking, all right, John's going to struggle with this question. Let me help him already go ahead and think of somebody else in his life. Maybe his brother going on a mission, something like that, where I'm going to let him think of somebody else in his life. And that does work in that regard, to, in that way. Um, I would give you one caution uh, that's not based on anything anybody said in here. Uh, it's just one that's come to my mind. I worry. I love some of the podcasts. I, I, I consume a, a, a number of them for personal study. Um, one of the things I worry about, though, on these, as awesome as several of them are such great tools, I worry that it shifts my brain to see certain things, and I miss the Holy Ghost showing me something for my lesson. So my personal study, I have to be careful not to hinder the experience I want with, my, with the Holy Ghost as I prepare my lesson. So if I am to share with them one of my stories in the lesson at first, then I might, 
I might hurt or hinder the ability of the Holy Ghost to bring something to their memory. So I want to be cautious of that. President Iring in a, a different address referenced, I could have shared with you experiences I've had with this doctrine principle, but rather let's go look in the scriptures at their experiences they've had and how I want to hear from you, your experiences you've had. So he actually, President Iring placed all, us on the backside thinking, be careful that we don't share ours too quickly. So where that is going to land at in your lesson, I think you're just going to be revelatory and, and just listen to the impressions. And you'll feel when the spirit help, kind of pulls the, the <laughs> throttle back on you and, and you don't, maybe you feel kind of hindered to share, act on that impression. You may share, but it may give, you, give it a minute to let some people think in that pause, that quiet time Sister Green referenced earlier. Sister Marshall, and then I'm going to go through and read some of these out loud for the recording. Mine didn't make it on there because I didn't know we were supposed to write it. But the question I wanted, is it wrong to ask, what does it mean to learn, not on to lean, not on your own understanding and see what they have to say about okay. that? What exactly does that mean? Excellent. Is that a wrong thing to ask? Or I think it depends on your class and the direction you're at. I don't, I don't know that there's any wrong questions or, of how to approach these. I think what you get into is you ask maybe a question that you first started and you see from their eyes whether that question linked or not to where the Spirit's trying to take you with connecting them to the atonement of Christ, the enabling power and promises of the temple, and gathering Israel to return back. Does that help? And is their eyes give you an idea of whether or not it's working or not? You then may ask additional questions or get impressions of follow-up questions to go along with it. And their responses obviously will just direct a lot of that. Sister Marshall, does that answer that? All right, let's read some of these really fast. Um, yeah, from what I... Oh, I'm sorry, there was a delay in that. I'm sorry, Sister Marshall. So whether it's right or wrong depends on how it links to the students. Yes, I think that, I, that's, my, how that's my belief. React. That's my belief. Is I, I might have an awesome question, I ask it. I, we've all done this, right? We ask the question, we get crickets. We go, okay, that's not, and, and you throw up this little Hail Mary real quick, and the Lord says, hey, twist that question, now ask this, and it changes the room. So I, I think it's part of a, the class is an organism, if you will, that's developing and, and working with it. So um, let me read some of these really here. Have you ever been scared or worried about something and felt that you should pray? This is another one. Ponder how coming to seminary each morning shows that you've been trusting the Lord. How has the act of trusting guided you every day as you go throughout your day going to school? Have you have you felt comforted that things would turn out all right? I would ask this or these experiences can help you feel com comfortable in making decisions in the future. Can you remember a time when you did lean? Under your own understanding, how could it have been different had you included the Lord? When have you ever chosen to trust the Lord, even when you wanted another way, or maybe thought your whole heart would break? This may be inspired by personal knowledge with my students in mind. But Woodruff writes, how can you think that the church leaders don't understand you or that their counsel was wrong? Sister Page, tell me a time when you had an absolute confidence in something or someone. So a great primer to the next one. Can you think of a time when someone in your family trusted the Lord when it didn't make any sense? Then the next question being, how did this turn out for them? Did it strengthen their testimony? Leading to the next question, can you think of a way this story could help you as you lean or trust in the Lord? And those are the, the linking of those questions into one train. When have you trusted the Lord in the little things? How can you see the same trust you have in the Lord in the bigger things? Can we trust the Lord? Is that true? How, how do we know it's true? In what ways have you trusted the Lord to help you make important decisions? 
discuss different experiences that we've had in the Lord directing our paths or someone that we know had experiences that we could share. So they're all great. Thank you for, for sharing those. Um, I love how the Savior, when he has those moments, connects them with revelation. So when they think back on, maybe it was their brother going on a mission, as we referenced earlier. Maybe it was brother or sister went on a mission. And they recalled that. I think it's great to say, I love how the Holy Ghost reminded you that experience. Just like the Savior said to Peter, that's not your opinion, Peter. The, 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 the Spirit reminded you that. And then, so let me scare you with something. I was in a council one time with a bunch of youth, and we were discussing a youth conference type thing and it was going to be at the temple in the building across the street from the temple and one of the lessons was going to be on temple marriage and all of you said we don't want a lesson on temple marriage and i thought yeah that's that's not going to work well <laughs> we this is the whole point of the promised blessings of the temple so the question wasn't why right we need to ask more inspired questions what concerns you about having a lesson on a couple being sealed for time and eternity. And the answer they said was this, our group doesn't, isn't as concerned about what's gonna happen five or 10 years down the road. If we can't see how we can't use it today, we're not as interested in it. Now that shook me to my core in that moment. This wasn't one kid's opinion. This was, some, this was a whole room full of youth all agreeing. If I can't see how I can use it today, then it's, I don't see value in it. So what we're doing in this is what the Savior was doing. Peter, yes, what you say, I, that I am the Christ, you got by personal revelation. That revelation is going to help you down the road where the adversary won't be able to break you when he tries. So this truth, this revelation you got is going to be really critical to you today because the adversary is coming at you, Peter. So as we as teachers are framing these experiences with our memories and helping them to connect that to doctrine and principles, we want them to see that they need to use that today when they leave the classroom. So one of the questions coming behind that is going to be, how can you use this today when you leave this room? Where will you? Where is this going to be, this truth going to be used today as you act on these gospel truths? So in our discussion here, where well, we've gone through that, questions that invite feelings, we've got to, we're, we're against the clock and have to wrap up. Um, Brother Woodruff, would you mind reading what is in front of us? This is from Gospel Teaching and Learning Handbook, talking about uh, these feelings that we're trying to, to link to. Sure. Um, some questions help students think about and understand gospel principles and doctrines, while others can cause them to reflect on spiritual experiences and lead students to feel more deeply the truthfulness and significance of a gospel principle or doctrine in their lives. Many times, those feelings engender a stronger desire in the hearts of students to live a gospel principle more faithfully. Thank you so much. And so here are some of the examples from the handbook that are in reference. Here are some examples to questions that can encourage feeling and invite testimony. When have you felt the peace and joy that comes from forgiving someone? So now it's going to draw back on when you've had to forgive somebody or how grateful. And it might even tie back into another one. How have you felt when someone forgave you when you asked to be forgiven? And obviously link this to Christ. Think of a time when the Lord directed your decision because you trusted in him rather than relying on your own understanding. Now look at the next part. How are you blessed for doing so? If you could personally express your gratitude to the Savior for sacrifice for you, what would you tell him? So now there's your linking to going forward. How is your life different because of what happened in the sacred grove? It's the same thing President Nelson asked. Right? How has your life been impacted by the first vision in the Book of Mormon? When have you seen others respond faithfully to trials? How has that influenced you? So as, as we are striving to invite students to come to these doctrinal truths, 
and we're wanting them to link emotion and, and past experiences to it, we, mu we can't stop there. We have to then take the question to the next one. And, and so what? Therefore, what? How are you going to connect this to today when we, when we leave here? So I, I know that as we um, strive to um, try hard to help our students have this experience, that the spirit will work with us and will help us to, to phrase these questions. Um, I think the most important thing we can do in our lesson prep is to understanding that purpose and objective is to ask ourselves, what do I want students to walk away with in behavior based on a doctrinal truth? And then ask the Lord, what are some questions that will help them to feel and recognize these experiences? I know the Savior wants them to feel and recognize the truths that will impact them eternally and will help them with the Holy Ghost connect those by him bringing into their mind experiences they've had with him already, that they've already had it. They just need to be remembered. it. And I say these things in Jesus Christ, amen. Now we'll stay on for a few minutes if somebody wants to ask some questions or give some you know, thoughts or share, but uh, for the sake of our devotional time, we'll um, wrap up. Can I get a volunteer for a closing prayer of someone who's not said anything yet? I'll give it. Thank you, Sister Mark. Hi, Father in Heaven. We're so grateful for the blessings that these lessons are in our lives. We're thankful <clears throat> for the spirit that we felt, and we're thankful for the things that we have learned. We ask thee to please bless us with the thy spirit so that we can know how to ask questions and how to help our students connect more fully and closely with thee and thy son and we say these in the name of jesus christ amen amen thank you sister martin